Okay, let's, uh, let's, have, a, let's have a start. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Oh, Jesus. Jesus. We are just talking about that um, move of your, of your heart uh, in, uh, in, in Reading. Um, so exciting to see uh, young people, um, old people, any people come into a place where they finally realise that you are the Christ, the saviour of the world. And we just want to bless what you're doing in Reading, Lord. We want to keep on blessing it and the momentum in it. And keep the church pure and, and keep the, the leaders wise and, and keep the prayer going and, and make good things fall and may it spill out more and more and more and more. And the, the, the visionaries to sow the seed around and to light fires here and there and to, to do good things, Lord, that the, that the whole of the country, may, maybe the whole of the world be affected by what you're doing, Lord Jesus. Father, we just know that you're on the move and it's exciting. And here on this uh, day that we remember that you have risen, that you have come back to life, that sense of knowing again that you are overcoming death. Thank you. We pray that you would use your word today to inspire us, to equip us, to strengthen us, to resource us, that we might be full of you and less of ourselves. Come Holy Spirit, take your word into our hearts. Let it be everything you want it to be. Glory to you, Lord. Glory to you. Glory to you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Yeah, bless you too. Yeah, thank you, Lord. You know, I just love it when uh, the presence of the Lord is here with us. Um, you know, it's, it's, it changes something. It makes like, the atmosphere, it moves uh, the dynamics of what was planned, what was intended. It, it, there, there's something tangible about when God is with us. And um, feeling the sense of God being with you. Now, you might be troubled. God is with you. God is with you. You might be full of joy. God is with you. You know, whatever level of the spectrum you're on, God is with us. And that is just so good. Mm -hmm. And we are the most privileged of all peoples because God is with us. Mm -hmm. So that's good, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's good. So we can smile. Mm -hmm. We can rejoice and be glad. For this is the day the Lord has made. <clears throat> so why was that? This is Easter. This is our Easter service. We have. A, we thank you, Sally, for leading us in the worship. You did great. Well done. And Tim and the, and everyone else is involved. Bless, bless you. We thank you for that. And uh, and uh, this is my part, really. And you know, Easter is kind of you know a focus point. We kind of know what the program is. We we know what we're trying to do. And yet there's a sense in which we always need to be open and listening to the Lord, you know. Do you hear God? Yes. You need to. As a Christian, you need to hear God. If you don't hear God, then you're going to be lost. You need to know his voice, the master's voice. You need to know when he says yay and nay and, and this way and that. You need to know, unless you find yourself wandering nowhere, nowhere to, what to do, where to go. You need to hear the voice of God. And I do you know, a fair amount of walking and uh, all sorts of reasons. Uh, but uh, I, I was out walking this week. And I, as I was walking and just talking, I think it was this week or last week, I can't remember now, it's a blur, but I was walking and I was with God. And um, we got this um, bench where I walk. It's in the field somewhere. There's this big bench. And I, what I do is I stand on this bench and my dog comes up and he jumps, stands on, this, on the bench with me. And I, and I look to the north, and I look to the south, and I look to the east, and I look to the west. And I talk to my God, and I tell my God, God, bless the north, and bless the south, and bless the east, and bless the west, and pour out your spirit on the land, and make good things happen on the earth. Because we need the goodness of God working in the earth, if we're going to have any transformation in the earth. And as I was talking and just chatting with God and praying to God, my God, he, he said to me uh, three Ps. And, you know, I kind of was connected to the Baptist Church for years, really. So I guess I'm a bit of a Baptist minister, although I'm not really. Uh, but uh, there's, a, there's a sense of, uh, they always have threes. That's what happens in the Baptist Church. <laughs> so um, so um, 
but three P gave me three P's, and these are the three P's he gave me. No, he didn't actually give me three P's. You know, he gave me three, <laughs> three P's. And the first one was the uh, presence. You know, the presence to know His presence is with us, and you need to know if you're a Christian that you live in the presence of God. And the next one was purpose, and we need to know what our purpose is is here on the earth. Jesus knew why he came. He knew his purpose. And he came for this very day, in fact, the day that we remember, the Easter process. But we need to know our purpose. We need need to know what we're about and why we're here. We don't need to be drifters. We need to know the purposes as to why we are who we are. And then we need to know his power, the third P, his power. To know his power to overcome. As Christians, we need to know the purposes of God, we need to know the power of God, and we need to know the presence of God. And so I begin, Ephesians 15, 23. For this reason I too, having heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, which exists among you, and your love for all the saints, says the Apostle Paul, do not cease giving thanks for you, that's Paul speaking, while making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. We need to know our God. Verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know, not that you will hope only, that you will know what is the hope of his calling. That's the purpose. What are the riches of his glory of the inheritance in the saints? That's us. And what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe. God has made available to us power to be those who overcome. These are in accordance with the working of strength, the strength of his might, which he has brought about in Christ. In Christ Jesus, God has done something, and we are the inheritance, the, inher- the inheritors of that something that God done in Jesus. We are the ones who are the benefactors. Do you feel like a benefactor today (laughs) you're not sure this is why we're celebrating Easter we are the benefactors do you feel like a benefactor you need to because when you're a benefactor then you live with your shoulders out and you walk tall because you have inherited an inheritance because of what he did These are in accordance with the work of his strength and might which he has brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead. When he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand. That's the hand of authority. Jesus has been given all authority at the right hand in the heavenly places. Not just for them, far above all ruler and authority. That means he is the highest authority. You know, we're England, in the UK, and for years and years and years we've been kind of subordinate to Brussels, you know, the, the European thing. And now we're j- jumping out of that, we're trying to, so they say. We'll see. But him, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that has been named, not only in this age, that age, but in this age to come. This age. Jesus is still the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. He is going to get and has got and has been given the highest accolade that could possibly be given. That's the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. I've got to de honkatize you. We have been raised, he has been raised from the dead and seated at the right hand in the heavenly places. Uh, 22. And he has put all things in, this is God, has put all things into subjection under his feet, which means everything is under 
Jesus' authority, under his feet. When God said to the serpent, that man is going to crush your neck, he was thinking of a day when Jesus would gain the victory over everything. And he would put all things in subjection under his feet. And he has given him head over all things to the church, which is the body, the fullness of him who feels all and is in all. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, in your heart. This is the word of faith which we are preaching. That, if we confess with our mouth, it's not here. If we confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in our heart that we have been raised from the dead, we will be saved. For with the mouth, with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. We are saved because of what took place as we remember and recall the reality of the Easter story. So whoever believes in him, says the scripture, will not be disappointed. Is there anyone here disappointed today in the Saviour? who they put their trust. Are you disappointed? The truth is, that's not completely true. Though you are not disappointed, you have had disappointments, even in your journey with your Lord. And there's not a person here who has not experienced the sense of disappointment, of walking the walk and talking the talk, because that's the truth. Because life is full of different things that confuse us and disturb us. But Easter, Easter is God's model for victory over pain, over confusion, over uncertainty, certainty, over disappointment. Easter is God's model of victory over death. And it can't get any worse than death. Everything might lead to death. You know, you might get a condition that leads to death, but death is the ultimate reality of the condition doesn't matter what you feel like or what you experience or what you encounter. Ultimately, that encounter, that negative encounter, is looking to take you to a place of darkness, a, a place of despair, a place of death and decay. But we've already said, he has been given victory, power over death and everything. And that Easter message is God's model for victory over pain. Knowing what to do on the worst days of your life. Easter is the model. Knowing what to do on the worst days of your life. Easter is the model. So day one, Friday. As we walked Friday through Wareham, even with the knowledge of the child that had died the day before, we felt a sense of sadness for the child and the parents and everything that's gone on. And the lawyer driver, Debbie, pointed out. The day of suffering for Jesus Christ we remember Friday, Good Friday. A day of suffering, physically beaten, whipped, spat upon, pierced with a crown of thorns, emotionally rejected, mocked, insulted, spiritually, alone, abandoned, ashamed, guilty. Jesus experienced all of that reality. He carried our guilt, someone Sally said this morning, he carried our guilt and our shame upon his shoulders. Can you imagine what it must have been like to carry the weight of humanity's guilt and shame upon your shoulders? The reality of this hit me this week and I thought to myself, how does a murderer feel when a murderer murders? He now knows, she now knows that they are a murderer, a paedophile, a rapist. Now, there they may be some of them have no heart or conscience and therefore feel nothing. 
Or maybe they do feel the shame and the guilt. One person doing one act. And Jesus bore the reality of that filth, that shame, that guilt upon himself in that day. He felt deep anguish as he carried the weight of sin upon his shoulders. He felt that the humanity and the shame of humanity upon himself. To feel like a rapist, to feel like a murderer, to feel like an abuser, to feel like a child beater. He felt the pain of it in himself. He carried our guilt and our shame upon his shoulders. Can you imagine what that must have been like? How do you get through pain encounters? Pet, P, P, P. Presence, purpose, power. Jesus was truly in deep anguish. And so he prayed. He prayed to his father. And when you are in deep pain, you need to learn to pray as Jesus prayed. And he prayed these words, my God, my God, in the depth of that concluding encounter, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was the first time Jesus ever referenced in a prayer to God, the name God. Up to then, he'd only ever called him Father. But the reality of the intimacy that God had known with Jesus and Jesus had known with God at that point when he carried the weight of the world upon his shoulders and he became sin for man, for, 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 to take away the sin of man. He became the shame, the guilt, the filth. God turned away from him. And he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Never in all of ever before time had that taken place. Only Jesus had known him as God, as father, as intimacy. But now, oh my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He called out to him when, when he did not understand. We need to learn, brothers and sisters, to call out to him when we don't understand because Jesus called out to him. We need to learn to confess our pain to God. It's okay to tell God that you don't want to suffer. Jesus didn't want to suffer. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane didn't want to suffer. But he cried out these words along with that plea to not suffer. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. You know, we need to learn, even as Christians, that some suffering is necessary if we are to make changes in the reality of who we are. And there is a desert encounter for all of us as we learn to trust God in the uncertainties. God is teaching us to invest ourselves in the troubled times, in the painful times and the painful experiences that we have in life. We need to learn to express also our pains to our friends. Jesus did that as well. Jesus learned to express his pain to his friends in the garden. He said to his friends, be with me, pray with me in this moment. Now, it's true they let him down. It's true, it's true that they abandoned him. But he asked. He needed the companionship of friends. And we need to learn as Christians to not face burdens on our own, our darkest days on our own. We need to learn to reach out to friends, the people of God who God has given to us. Let the body of Christ be with you when you suffer on your darkest days. But all of these encounters that I've just expressed to you happen because it's day one. Because it's Friday. But Sundays are coming. And then came day two. You know, trusting in him even when we don't understand. And day two really is a day of confusion. Day two is a day of confusion. Many a night I've spent tossing and turning wrestling with my thoughts and my feelings and not, trying, not being able to get through the confusion of my mind. 
and found myself saying to God, God, I don't understand. But all I know is, I love you. Learning to trust God on the Saturday, the day of confusion. And saying to God, no matter what, I have invested my trust in you. I cannot see. Nothing is changing. There's no food in the cupboard. Life doesn't seem to be treating me all that well. But I am going to trust in you. Though the olive tree should not blossom. You remember, I am going to trust in you. The disciples, they were confused on that, that, that Saturday, that second day. They were afraid. They were broken hearted. There was doubt in their hearts. They, they, they were saying to themselves, was he not the Christ? They, 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 they were troubled. They, they, they were fearful of their lives. They were, why did this happen? Why did it happen? Even though he had told them it would happen, why did it happen? There was, and we ourselves have often found ourselves in the dark days of our lives, saying, why is this happening? Selfish people say, why is this happening to me? And I kind of feel like that often means it's all right if it happens to someone else. Well, it's not all right if it happens to someone else. It's just bad because it's bad. <coughs> Why is this happening? I'm confused. I don't understand. These are the dark days of our lives. We ask, we're left with, what's happening? Why is this taking place? We think of the, the could-haves, the would-haves, but he didn't. You know... Do you remember once he came to a leper and he said to him, if you want to, you can make me clean. Jesus, fortunately for that leper, said, I do want to. But I've watched them die. I've seen their lives fade away. And I've cried out to God, God, would you heal them? Would you minister your love to them? I've seen them lose this and, and abandon that. I've seen them walk away. And I've said, God, why? How is this happening? He could have. But he didn't. Bad experiences, they will either make you better or they will make you bitter, depending on where you position yourselves. And the Easter message is about positioning ourselves with God. Staying true to God in the storms of our lives. Reposition ourselves is about remembering and relying on his promises, the three Ps, presence, purpose, and power. I remember preaching a sermon 40 years ago, and I said these words, the, the crux of the sermon was this, we learn in peacetime how to stand firm and fight so that when the war comes, we are equipped to press in to victory. We do not want to be learning how to swing a sword and hold a shield in a wartime. It's too late. We need to learn to trust in the Lord in the quiet times, in the stable times of our lives. So that when the storms come, we can hold the shield because we know how to hold it. And we can hold the sword because we know how to swing it. We don't want to be learning to use the weapons of God to defend ourselves when it's wartime already. It's still only Saturday, but Sunday's coming. Day three. The day of joy and victory because of the resurrection. We talked about it already this morning. The resurrection power comes as the risen Christ breaks free from death and he bursts into new life, into a new expression of who he is, into the newness of God's purposes for him in the resurrection power. Power, brothers and sisters, comes through the resurrection We need to learn to receive his promises, the promise that he will be with us in our pain. We need to remember the purpose, the purpose that he has called us to be something, 
But we need to remember his power to overcome all things. Can you say all things? All things. That means everything. everything. That means nothing that is facing you or that you will ever face, he cannot be with you and overcome. He's on our side. But without the resurrection, there could be no resurrection power. And the reality of salvation would just be a myth. All the things Jesus did would just be a myth. But the resurrection does something. You see, anyone could claim to be a saviour. In fact, they do. And history is full of people who have claimed to be a saviour. But the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ proves he is the saviour. He's not a saviour, he's the saviour. And the reason why he's the saviour is because death holds everyone who is guilty of sin. But death could not hold Jesus in the ground because he was not guilty of sin, because he was innocent of sin and death had no hold on him. And that's why it had to let him go and that's why Jesus rose from the dead because he is the sinless saviour. He is the Lord Christ. He is the one and only true God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever puts their trust in him should not perish but have eternal life. Now without the resurrection, none of that counts. But the resurrection authenticates. You know in Chester they used to put the mark of silver on the silver atoms to prove, to authenticate this is silver. And God, when he raised Jesus from the dead, he demonstrated his power over death and proved that Jesus is the Saviour. John 11, 25, 26. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, yes. Do you believe that putting your faith in Jesus has given you eternal life? Yes. Amen. To believe, brothers and sisters, is to be proactive. As is truly not to believe. To choose not to believe is a proactive declaration. And the concept of believing is about making a choice. And the resurrection gives us enough evidence to be able to authenticate that he is the Christ. The Saviour. It's a choice based upon presented facts that are historical. Now, whether you believe the historical accounts of them is a choice you have to make. But you know there's more evidence for Jesus than Julius Caesar. But you believe in him. Well, then believe in the, you believe about him. Then believe, believe in the Christ. The truth is, most people out there have not considered the facts. And the reason they haven't not considered the facts is because Christians haven't told them the facts. And often the reason why Christians haven't told them the facts is because the Christians don't even know the facts. They don't know that it's about the resurrection power of God working in their lives to overcome the reality of what it means to be released from sin, from shame, from guilt, from fear. People are too busy trying to clean themselves up instead of relying on the grace of God. The, re the resurrection facts alone demonstrate God's salvation story. Who is able to come back from the dead? No one, but Christ came back from the dead. And the reason he came back from the dead is because Sunday is finally here. Amen. So he has risen. Philippians 3, 10, 11. That 
I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death in order that I may obtain to the resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, has truly risen. And the, in the Anglican church they say, he is risen indeed. So we say again, Jesus Christ is truly risen. He has risen indeed. Amen. Richard. Father, thank you for this day of celebration. Thank you uh, for this day uh, when you made our joy complete. Uh, Father, thank you as well. This is a day uh, where all the sorrows of the world can be rested on you as well. Uh, and Lord, again, we bring this family who lost their little boy to you. Uh, and Lord, that in Easter, uh, they'll be able to see you uh, and you can carry them through. But thank you for Easter. Thank you for your sacrifice for us. And let us take that as we go out this week. Amen. Amen. Amen.